Welcome back to the Course Creation Incubator. I'm Gina Anativia, here to help you get your course done and out to market. And after seven plus years in my digital marketing career, I've seen that the most successful course creators all have personality. They evoke emotion. There's humor, there's wit to them. And when I think of humor and wit, I think of my friend, Mike Pacione. Now, when you look at your group of friends, do you have that one friend that makes you laugh so hard your kidneys ache? He's a genius story coach. He's the guy that authors, course creators, speakers go to when they need to work on their talks because he knows how to take a story or a talk or a piece of content that starts out as, well, it's okay. And then he injects personality into it and it becomes something truly spectacular. I'll name drop just for a moment to give you a sense of Mike's clients and how special he is. Amy Porterfield, Donald Miller, Pat Flint, James Clear. And yes, you know I love Atomic Habits because I don't shut up about the book in this podcast. And yes, Mike is their go-to guy for speaking and for making their presentations even better. I wanted Mike on today so you and I can learn more about how to take our own stories to another plane of existence where folks, students, customers can help but pay attention to you, engage with you, and ultimately buy from you. Now, Mike helps me with my own talks. Every single time, he makes me better. You'll hear us talk more about that process as part of this chat. Even if you're not working on a talk or scripting your course right now, you can use Mike's advice in so many different places as a course creator, in your sales videos, your welcome videos, for stories to start your lessons. Because once you become a great storyteller, doors open, students engage, and that's right, students finish. Oh, and did I mention that Mike's funny? <laughs> I haven't laughed this hard in an interview since, well, I, I can't even tell you. I don't think I've ever laughed this hard during an interview. All right, let's listen in. Hey, Mike, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad to have you on. Gina, Anativia, it's our time. I love it. <laughs> Two Italian people with dramatic names. Very dramatic. <laughs> that can't be pronounced. I'll just dive in to the first question because we want to talk about content today. This and is such a Gina move. Like we're going to get right down to business. I know. I'm not going to fluff this up. I'm not. I'm just going to get right to it. I want to talk about the best kind of content for your course that connects, engages people, leaves them thinking about what you have to say. This is what my students want to learn. How do we deliver that kind of content, Mike? Well, you wouldn't be having me on if stories wasn't one of the types of contents here, right? So That's right. people have probably heard something like this before, but we are hardwired to understand stories. If you think about, like I always, I always try to think about this, in a world before iPhone, before iWatches, is that what it's called? Apple Watch, whatever that. In a world before Apple Watch and yeah. iPod, iPhones and iPods and laptops and. I love that you said iPod. Yes. I know that was, it was, I think it was a glitch of the mouth, but it was kind of fun to say iPod. I haven't said that in a long time. Um, but in a world before all these types of electronics and before typewriter, before pencil and paper, before quill and ink, like, how did you pass along ideas? I mean, anybody could talk at any time, but the things that resonated with people, and if you think about it, a lot of our history comes from story because we can remember story a lot better than we can remember just random abstract facts. So stories, are, obviously I'm prejudiced towards stories. I love it. And that's how I make a living. So stories is one of the big ones, but it's not like the only way that you can connect. You know that, I know that. When I help people with speeches, one of my questions is always like, what would surprise the audience? Oh, I like what it. Is, what is something where there's some study that you thought was going to be X, but it's going to be Y? That is great content. Love that. Con content where you, so other answers, like content where you are live interacting with the audience and you're pulling them on things. That's great content. And then I think anything, this goes along with surprise, but anything that's misdirection. And when I say that, I mean, I mean that in terms of the content in itself or the way that you deliver it. So like the example I always give there, there's this guy, Scott Galloway. Do you know him? Mm -mm. Professor I'll, I'll G show, on, so. I think it's his podcast. Okay. Okay. This guy has his way of presenting is like way different from almost anybody. He talks so fast. 
And I always tell people you can talk faster that. than you think you can. Yeah. I this is like that. right up your alley. Right yeah. New York guy too. <laughs> so I always tell people you can talk faster than you think you can. People have long been told you talk too fast. Like Gina, you were probably told that at some point. I, but, I was told that today. Slow down. I'm told but you, that you're not. See, here's the thing. You're not <laughs> actually talking too fast. Because if you think about it, people like people will listen to this podcast at one and a half speed, maybe even two X speed. Yeah. And they can understand us. So it, the problem is not actually that you're talking too fast. It's that there's no break. And what I love about mm-hmm. Scott Galloway <laughs> is he almost talks too fast. <laughs> like he, he probably he probably talks at what would be like one point five for me. Um, but what I, what I love about that guy is then he will take breaks and when he takes a break, like you can feel this, it's, it's like a joke for the audience. He just, oh. he'll take us, he'll stop for 10 seconds and everybody's like, there's laughter. Like he doesn't say anything. He'll stop for 10 seconds. People will laugh. So all of that to say changing speeds, I think it's another one. And that can be in terms of misdirection or the way that you talk. And then of course, Gina and Mike will always advocate for humor. Definitely. Although like jokes are harder than jokes are harder than people think they are. How? Okay. You, that's one of my questions for you today, of course, Mike, because I think you're so funny and I know one of the reasons I love you, Mike, is because you think I'm funny. So I, that, I love it. And you tell me I'm funny. So <laughs> how, how do we add humor? Humor's hard. It's hard to be funny sometimes. Do you, do you have some tips on that? Yeah, totally. So I think, I think it's worth noting that humor around the dinner table is way different from humor on stage is way different from humor in a course Mm -hmm. around the dinner table. Like, let me break it to you. Part of the reason why people are laughing is because they know you already. (laughs) It is. (laughs) And and if you're an executive at a company, you're probably not as funny as you think you are either. People are laughing because it's, it's actually hierarchy that's happening. (laughs) You might be funny, but I'm just saying that it's, it's a little exaggerated when it's around people who know you or who are incentivized to laugh with you yep. Yep. versus random person. I, I don't mean this in a bad way, but I mean like someone who's unknown, who's trying to be funny on stage or in a course, it's actually very hard. So I think one of the things I would tell people is like change the goal. If, if you're picturing people cracking up over what you're saying, success is actually just getting them to smile Hmm. or, or okay. lightening the mood a little bit. Okay. I love We've that. probably all <laughs> probably all delivered a joke that bombed at some point. That's the worst difficult to recover from. So really what you're trying to do there is, is not so much to make everybody crack up. Although if you can do that, that's great, but it's just to lighten the mood. Because if you think about what's happening when someone's listening to you in a course, it's like they're writing things down constantly, or they're constantly thinking about the point that you just made. And that, that's, that's a lot and that's heavy. And depending on how long those modules are, like that, that could be, I don't know, like nine straight minutes of deep thought, right? So <laughs> just, I don't mean like Jack Handy, but like actual deep, like really, really thinking through it. So if you can just lighten the mood a little bit, even if it's not making someone laugh out loud, that's a great, great thing. I, I didn't answer your question. That's all. <laughs> that's how a seven you, minute okay, prelude. Like there, <laughs> how do you lighten the mood? I've, I've. I've lessened the goal, right? I've brought it back. I've diminished it a little bit, pulled it back. Now, how do I lighten the mood? Totally. So some things that work really well are um, like stories or examples of whatever your content is, examples of people who have been down that road before. And I don't mean this in a mean way, but who have screwed up. So I'm not saying make fun of them. Right. But something that you can say, because if you think about it, your audience is in a position where they are starting down the journey. And on some level, I don't know if they're feeling scared, but it's just a little uneasy. Yeah, so if you absolutely. can tell a story of someone who started there and really botched it, like <laughs> that's generally a win. I mean, there are categories of things that are funny. I, I think stories about your parents are generally funny, especially like Italian families have funny stories. My mom's Jewish. Like not that that's automatically funny, but there are like some things I can pull out about hair, but those things are funny. Um, I think one of the bits of advice that I would give people is to use other people's jokes. So what I mean by that is if you are repeatedly presenting your material and once upon a time, someone in your audience said something that made other people laugh, uh, use that in the future. Like, honestly, 
use that in the future. Okay. If you are not a funny person, use other content that is funny. Like that's a way of stealing humor from other people. Right. So, I mean, just think of how- And attribute it, right? Just give them- Oh, I'm not even, uh, you don't even need to do that. I'm talking about like a TikTok video that made you laugh. Oh. (laughs) Um, I don't know. I don't know like the the copyright on that, but like a TikTok video is great. Like uh, gifs, gifs, however you say that, they can be great. But I guess what I'm saying is if someone has already tested the material and people are saying it's really funny, if you can find a way to work that in, that's great. There has to be a purpose behind it, but that can be pretty great. I I have also found that just just highlighting my mistakes and then exaggerating them, you know, and just being self-deprecating and saying, okay, this is what I went through and, and then just bring it like up to the nth degree. Like that to me is funny or I think it's, or I think it's funny. No, it's so good, Gina. And you know why else? Because especially, so stage one and being funny is getting your audience to like you. Yeah. Uh, and that can be as simple as walking out on stage and smiling. So people generally will like someone who smiles. I mean, it helps if you can smile like a normal person, but if you smile, then they'll probably <laughs> like you. And then once your audience likes you, it's so much easier to be funny and self-deprecating is a great way of doing that. So like, what's a good, what's a good Gina self-deprecating story? Oh, I've got so many of them. Uh, when it comes to, to course creation, just, uh, like I think about all the mistakes that I used to make when when I first started out. All right, this was something that I was making fun of myself uh, last episode where I was talking about podcasting and how I used to help Amy, Amy Porterfield, our mutual friend, our dear dear friend. And I thought, oh, well, I worked on Amy's podcast. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a natural at this. <laughs> and then meanwhile, Mike, it takes me so long to record a freaking podcast or I'm better. It's been a year now, but when I first started, like it took me forever to write a script and then I would sit down and I would, you know, shut off the AC and I would t- tell my family to shut up, you know, for like, and I'm like, it'll be 20 minutes. Hour goes by. I'm recording a freaking podcast. And they're like, are you done, mom? Are you done? You know, and the learning curve <laughs> was so steep for me. So there is a great example of me thinking I'm a hot shot and really not. And, and it took me a year to get up to speed. Oh, that's good. So that reminds me of something that Amy, I'm going to get this slightly wrong, but Amy talks about when she was first creating a course and she's like, I did this, I did this, I did this, you know, so I hired this person and I had this person write the script and I shot it outside and paid this much for this, da, 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 da. And I did this, 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 I had two sales. Yeah. Yeah. She told, I remember when Amy, when we filmed back in the day and I had, cause when we'd work for Tony, we'd have these huge stage signs. Right. So when we first did, I can't even remember what the project was, Mike, but I did stage signs for Ames. This is back in the day. And I don't even know if that saw the light of day, whatever that project was, <laughs> but we, I think we might've pulled a all nighter or something on it. So it just goes to show, you know, that, it's messy at first and that's funny, right? Is that <laughs> it's totally, yeah. So it, it's totally funny. So I guess like, <laughs> summarizing all of that, like, um, things that, things that are reliably funny are, uh, family met. I shouldn't say it's reliably funny, but most people can pull out, like, if you spent time thinking about your family, you could pull out a funny family story yeah. or quirks that are funny. Yes. Like I've, t- okay, here's one with my dad, I just think that's the funniest thing in the world. And it's such an old person thing. My, my parents retired in, I think like 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. And upon retirement, there, there are very few things they have to answer for. Like you have to be on time for flights and things like that, but like you're really, you can pick and choose most things. Right. So after you do that for a while, that seeps its way into like every part of life. Well, here's what happened with my dad. They went, they went on vacation to Mexico. Uh, while on vacation, they'd forgotten to pack the Listerine. So, oh my gosh, this is an emergency. No, not the Listerine. Not like... the Listerine. Right? Uh, they go and buy a Mexican Listerine. Oh, well, my dad's unscrewing the top. He's like, oh my gosh, this is, this is great. And my mom's like, well, what? what? It's Listerine. What's the... <laughs> So in, in America, if you get Listerine, it's got like the, the safety valve on the top. You have to, yeah. you have to pinch it in and twi- Oh, Mexico. 
They don't have that regulation. You can just spin it. It comes right off. Right. No need for all that exertion of pinching the lid and removing it. So here's the funny part. My dad has kept that bottle of Listerine for like 12 years. He gets an American Listerine, pours it in the Mexican bottle so that he no longer has to <laughs> go through the hassle of removing the American lid. That's amazing. And that makes me immediately love your dad, right? So I feel an, an instant connection with your dad, right? And a connection with you because by extension of loving your dad, you're like, well, Mike can't be that bad because his dad's so endearing. But like, I'm guessing, I'm guessing most people have a family member who has quirks like that. And maybe it's not a parent, maybe it's cousin or brother or something like that. But um, those things are really funny. Self-deprecation is usually pretty funny. There are some things you have to do to make sure that the story hits. It's easy for a story to go, for a story or a joke to go too long. But like those things generally will work. If you're looking for a starting point for humor, I would start there. Okay. I love that. I hope you guys found that discussion, that roundabout interesting, and you add humor to your your content and your courses. Let me ask you the next question, Mike, because I think you're, one of your geniuses is I'll send you like a piece of a script or a presentation and you're like, okay, this is great. Now, when you're talking about this part, add this detail and you just riff on this detail and you make it a thousand times better. How do you know how to do that? And how can we do that for our own courses and content? Like know which detail to keep, which to augment, which to lose. You tell stories more often than you think. So in, like in a course, just about every time you were sharing an example, which you should share examples, people understand things well through examples. That, that's a big chance to tell a story. Right. Uh, an example in most ways really is a story. They're synonymous. But the way that most people do things is they just, the example will take like seven seconds and that's the end of it. And sometimes that's the right call, but other times the audience would benefit from you zooming out a little bit and almost treating it like it's the scene in a movie. So I remember the very first time, I think it was the first time that I ever helped you with this. You were talking about some story where Tony Robbins didn't like something that you wrote. Okay. There was some script you wrote right. something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you said it like that. And I was like, well, you're, you're too quick to get to that point. Like yeah. we need to be in the scene. We need to see Tony uh, scrolling on the, I don't remember if it was iPad, but like scrolling on the iPad and looking and, and the feelings that you have when this is happening, like Tony Robbins is going to love this. He's going to love it. He's going to love it. And then he doesn't love it. Like we need to see all of that. And if you used to add one or two details, usually one of the details is an action or like what something looks like. If you can add that and maybe what you were thinking or how you were feeling, that will take your examples and your stories to the next level. And that, that is ultimately one of my secrets. Okay. I love that. So think, zoom out and think about a scene in a movie and add one or two details, maybe what you're thinking. No, notice one or two, not eight. Right. Not, not eight. <laughs> yeah. Not, I was wearing Argyle socks. Then the audience is like, okay, Argyle socks is going to matter. No, like it needs to, like, <laughs> it can't just be like, and there needs to be a purpose for it. But one or two details helps the story that you're telling. And then the other, and I don't know if I'm getting in trouble for saying this, but uh, I love that you gave me permission to leave something out or I didn't, I kind of, I didn't alter the facts, but I changed something up a little bit. And you said to me, I'm giving you permission to say it this way instead. Yeah. So because what you were saying, okay, listen, everybody, <laughs> what I gave Gina permission to do was to just edit out part of what she was saying. She was trying, she was giving her work history. Right. And I said, okay, you can include that if you want, but it doesn't really add anything. It's just adding words to the speech. I'm giving you permission to just leave that out. So I wasn't giving you permission to like falsify it, but it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it just but leave, it, leave out. it out. And it was a detail that I thought I needed. Right. Right. So, and sometimes I think we get hung up on the details that we feel like we need. Right. Yep. Yes. And, and you gave me permission to say, like, let it go. And I was like, okay, great. Because if you think about it, it is okay. Everybody resists that because they're like, well, that's editing out what's true. You're already editing out what's true. Yeah. You did not say like, I went to work on January 29th and then I came <laughs> back on the 30th. Like nobody would want to hear that. So it's not as bad to say I spent three years at whatever company it was, but yeah. if it's not adding something, just get it out of there. Yeah. Okay, this is a great time. You said you have kind of a structure around how to create a great story. 
Do you want to walk through those points? Because I know that's something that we want to learn more about. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, it is good to have a, a time to aim for, and that's generally under a minute. Okay. There are exceptions to that. Sometimes people have epic stories. I can think of a few. I, I won't go into this one, but like. Well, I think for courses, that's a good rule of thumb, right? So what's that? <laughs> for courses, that's a good rule. Oh. Yeah, no, it, it, like it, story. Yeah. So for courses, especially a minute or less is a good way to go. Okay. If it is just a fantastic story and your audience can't believe that it involves you uh, repelling down a cliff in Alaska, sure. Like go over a minute. But for most people, like a minute is, is actually good because what you don't want is for your audience. And I realized that you can't, unless you're recording in front of people, you can't actually see this, but you don't want your audience thinking, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. That's bad. So my rule, I, I always test stories before I take them on stage yeah. or record on video. If the audience says, uh-huh, more than once, the story is too long. Done. So I get, I get one, uh-huh. Yeah. That's it. One. Um, there are, okay, so there are seven things that I have on my checklist for stories. I won't go through all seven because it'll take too long, but let me just go through. Well, one of them we basically went through already, which is consider how you can drop the audience into the scene. Okay. So we talked about that one or two details. Oftentimes it is helpful to hear what you were thinking in the moment. I want to repeat that. Okay. And usually we want to use that ironically. I'm thinking this is going to be the greatest thing ever. Nope. Tony rejected it. Literally yeah. threw my iPad to the ground. That probably didn't happen, but uh, that, that is, so the, one of those is the use of specific and purposeful detail. And I, I really think if you can share what you were thinking in the moment, that can be really good. Another, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you to do this for every story because it's not always necessary, but if the audience needs to know a little something about the person or people in the story, mm -hmm. think about how you can do that quickly. Yeah. Okay. I'm talking one sentence. So I'm telling a story about my dad. It's dad, like, yeah, yeah, totally. And my dad is the type of person who has kept a bottle of Mexican Listerine for 12 years because that makes it easier than undoing the American Listerine bottle, right? Like, mm -hmm. and even that feels a little bit long to me, but uh, this is my friend, Gina. Gina is my friend from New York. You know what I mean? Like she's from New <laughs> York. I always describe my friend, uh, my friend, Sarah, I always describe, I say, <laughs> I say, um, Sarah is my friend who eats quinoa for her cheat meal. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, just like really, really, it's worth the time. It's a great writing activity anyway, to think about how you can, you can help the audience understand the story via a really quick, like one sentence or less explanation of a person. There's a guy that I'm helping with the speech right now. He wants to tell a story in this speech about taking his daughter to college, like drive, the drive to college. And he, he, he's like, yeah. And you know, and she was out really late and, um, we're driving all the way. I think it was from Atlanta to Dallas. So that's a, however long drive. And she was out really late. So, and, and I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. We need to know what kind of driver you are. Ooh, like, yeah. are you, are you the dad? who has a spreadsheet, who has calculated how far he can go on a, on a tank of gas. And who knows if we stop one time, here's how much it'll delay us two times. Da, da, da. Are you that guy? Or are you like the hippie dad? Who's just like, Oh, we'll get there when we get there. You guys want to stop and, you know, like get out in new Orleans or something. I, I, that's not on the way, but you get the idea, right? Like, yeah. so consider that that helps the audience understand the people in the story. It does not need to be lengthy. If it is lengthy, it actually hurts the story. For the purpose of the story, there's basically only one detail that we would usually need to know about that person. So those are, those are two of the things that I say, but there's, there's a lot more, Gina. I'm well, resisting sounds, going. Yeah. It sounds like you're curious. I think like, like if I could distill it down, like you, there's, you're always asking questions. And you're always curious about the detail. Well, what was that like? What was he like? What, tell me a little bit more about that. You draw it out, right? And until you get the emotion behind it. Yes, because that's what a story actually is. Like that's the whole point. 
is that it gets the audience to an emotion. I don't mean that in a manip manipulative way. No, I know you don't. I think you you draw it out until you find something that makes you laugh or makes you go, huh, or gets gets a response from you. And then you know it's good. Totally. In my brain, I'm always wondering, how could I use this story? Yeah. So a lot of times it's like, what lesson is learned? Other times it's just, well, that, that was funny. We should find a way to work that in. But I, I am always trying to figure out the even if it's not the lesson, it's like, what angle could I take to get this in here? Because stories are interesting. Yeah. And I think if you, if you can't find that, you lose it. Like, you're like, that's a detail I don't need. Yeah, that's true. I totally get rid of it. Yeah. I'm breaking down it. your process. <laughs> this is Mike's process. Uh, um, I do. I delete it. And well, here's something else I would say. This is a recommendation for people. Once you start doing this and once you start getting good at stories, it's addictive. And you, I, I would recommend either have it on your phone or carry a pad of paper with you. I don't know, but yes, have a place where you can keep a catalog of stories. There was one, like I waited for years and I was so excited when I got to talk about it. So, you know, I'm a Philly guy. I grew up in Philadelphia. Yes. Or let's be honest. I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. <laughs> I have no accent. I don't say water, it's water. Um, but I grew up in the suburbs. Uh, my friend, so my friend Nate, his, his mom. Okay. You've seen the episode of the office where they have like all the Ben Franklins that come in. Maybe. Okay. Well, that's, there's an episode of the office where they okay. have all these Ben Franklin impersonators. That's a real thing in Philadelphia. Oh like, yeah. That, yes. That is a real thing. Yes. So there are actors who play George Washington, Betsy Ross. But, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my friend Nate's mom was dating the guy who played Ben Franklin. So after high school, I would go over to Nate's house and just Ben Franklin would be there. And he was always in character. Like we're talking the guy suspenders at all times, bifocals, hair the same way, colonial era pants. Mm. I thought this was so interesting. I had no idea how to work it into a talk. And I look back on it now, there are actually a few different ways that you could use it. But the way that I used it was... I, I found out why that guy was the way he was. And it, it was pretty simple. He had the same birthday as Ben Franklin. And he discovered that when he was like 12 or something. And he just became obsessed with Ben Franklin his whole life. Now, you may or may not think it was cool to basically become Ben Franklin and have your name be Ralph, but tell people that your name is Ben. You might not take it that far. But the, the question, and this is how I used it in the talk, is like, what do you feel so inspired by that you would keep going well beyond what is considered normal? That that's and how I used it. Up, and then you would bring up this, this guy who totally embodied Ben Franklin. Okay. So yeah. you, and you held on the, the point is you held on to the story, right? Yeah, forever. So you could use it. So I thought about you last night because I remembered a story when I failed my high school swim test <laughs> and I came from a, a legendary high school, suburbs of New York, suburbs. And uh, we had like, we had an all state, all state uh, swim, swim team. And I was a pretty good athlete. And they thought, oh, Gina's going to be a really great swimmer. I can't swim that well. And anyway, so I'm going to do... <laughs> It was a freaking nightmare, guys. Why so did they think I you'd be good at swimming? Those because, like because I'm a good, I'm a pretty good athlete. And my but brother, those things... it's because of my brother. My brother was like a three sport, incredible athlete, football, baseball, everything. So like Joey O is amazing. So they thought I was gonna be a good swimmer, and it was humiliating. And I will be working that story in somewhere for the future because I th I thought about that last night. I thought of you. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, yeah. So where you would go with that is like, do you know what it feels like when the expectations are this high? and you know that you can't do it and you do it anyway. And then it's every bit as bad as you thought it was going to be like, that's, that's your story. Yeah. There you go. Right. You or go. I yeah. should have just said no. Like that would be another way to frame that. <laughs> I should have just bowed out. <laughs> like, no, really? I know I have a good jumper. I cannot swim like that, that, you know, like that could be your story. That could be the, the moral. So the, the added value here is take your stories down. Like, it doesn't matter. Like I dreamed of it last night. I remembered it. So whatever it is, have, I have uh, index cards next to me in bed and I always have something to write on next to me. I do. <laughs> and I wrote, and I just jot them down because you never know when, when it's going to hit you, when these stories are going to hit you. What, what's, 
What's your favorite course creator story, by the way? Do you have one? This is going to sound like I'm just bringing it up because you and I both know and love Amy Porterfield, but it actually is like the most, just the greatest story. Or It's a story I love because I can picture the whole thing happening. So Amy, Amy talks about, you know, she was working for Tony Robbins and she quit that job uh, and she started doing freelance. She would, hold on, let me get it. I can get it. I can get it. Okay. She was working freelance. She's returning from some business trip. As soon as the plane lands, this is like pre-texting. As soon as the plane lands, remember the plane would land. They would say, you can turn on your phone and like yes. everybody would get a phone call. So Amy got one of those phone calls. It's the guy. It, it's one of her now eight freelance clients, which are really eight bosses. Yeah. So Amy answers the phone. She's got the phone in one hand. She's got her wheelie bag in the other. She's on the tarmac. She's walking. She's like got the phone nudged between her shoulder and her ear. And the guy's just yelling at her. And at that moment, she realizes, oh, I stopped working for Tony because I didn't want to have a boss anymore. Now I have eight different bosses. This is worse. And I love that story because I can picture the whole thing. I can hear, I, I can almost like hear in her brain, her thinking that. And that's what your audience wants in a story. Love that. Is they want they want a little piece of what's going on in your brain. And you know, I hadn't really thought about it until now because that's ultimately what they want in the course. That's yes. why they're buying the course, right? That's right. So what did that I could see that in the intro to the course on your sales page, right? As a part of a lesson. You could put that anywhere in the course. And and you guys can't see Mike right now, but he was kind of holding a phone. He was making a, a phone with his hand. And it was like, he's kind of reimagining it too. And you could do that too. Like, you know, share that expression. That's part of the story, right? So. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Yeah, because I wasn't even conscious I was doing that. But it's what it really is. I'm picturing that whole thing happening. It's not like I was there when it happened to Amy either. Right, but, but, that, you, that's, but you are reimagining it almost yeah. for her, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you have to, I want you to do the, like, that was very visceral for me. So I want you to do the same if you're listening right now for your students. Totally. And yeah. And details. Yeah. And honestly, like if you can act a part out, that's amazing. Yeah. So I don't have anything to add to that. Just that's that, like, that's a good, like, that's, that's great. If you can act a part of it out, if they can, if we can see you walking, um, if there's a character in your story who has a strange walk or like, okay, I remember um, my sixth grade teacher, I gave this story to someone else to use. I was like, my sixth grade teacher yeah. was so boring. Mr. Epifanio, he was so boring. The only thing that kept us awake is that he wore bifocals and they would like slowly go down his nose and I was always <laughs> waiting for them to fall off, but they would just rest on the edge of his nose. If you can, if you could like act that out, it's slowly falling. Picture yourself doing that person okay. listening to Gina's podcast like that, that adds to the speech. Tension point right? Yeah. I love that. <laughs> That's great. Mike, this has been so good. I want to leave you with wait, two questions before I leave you. I can uh, give shorter answers too. Do you want to do lightning rounds? No, I don't. I don't do lightning round. Should I start doing lightning? <laughs> Sorry. I'm not trying to take over your podcast. <laughs> I, I just wanted to know you're a Philly guy now for now, right? Portland just, just moved. And what's your favorite bite in Philly? Well, besides Wawa, obviously. Outside of Wawa. <laughs> I hope you ventured outside of Wawa. If you don't know Wawa, it is a, it's a 7-Eleven of Philly, but a far better. Far better. Far, far. I know Mike's looking at me right now with a horrified face that I compared Wawa to 7-Eleven. Yeah. Um, besides Wawa. Okay. There, I love McNally's. I don't know if you've ever been. McNally's is like my favorite Philly place every single time I'm home. McNally's chicken cheese steak, Ooh. long roll, fried yeah. onions, real good. good. Kate Winslet wore a McNally's t-shirt on one of the mayor of East Town episodes. Mayor of East Town, that was so good. Yeah, she was uh, so, so good. She was so good. So I I know that people want like a fancier place, but my place. No, is McNally's. no, that's a great answer. That's your <laughs> And where can people hear more about you to learn more about storytelling and and doing good content. Totally. Yeah. So <clears throat> I help people with telling stories in, in basically any form, um, but usually it's speeches. And with that being the case, one of the thing, one of the things that I've done on my site that anybody can download 
Uh, the most popular TED Talk of all time is Sir Ken Robinson. It's like over 70 million views. Candidly, a lot of what people love about that are the stories. And there are two towards the beginning that are especially powerful. I have seen them used in a million different speeches, workshops, trainings, all of it. So I broke down why, like what Ooh. is effective in those. Is this your, yeah. this is your download on your this website? Is, yeah. Well, it's a secret download. Yeah. Oh. So are you going to yeah. give me the secret link? <laughs> secret link. <laughs> so it's miketalks.co. That's, that's the site. miketalks.co slash Ken. His name's Sir Ken Robinson. So miketalks.co slash Ken. The site itself is miketalks.co. I, uh, it, a free, my freebie on the site is actually, hold on. Do you know, when is this going to publish next week? Oh, next week. Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I just didn't know if it was like October or something. No, next week. Cause I'm going to change it, but I won't change by next week. No. Yeah. Okay. So, but do you want to mention the other one on your site or do you yeah, yeah, no, it's just, there's one right now that I'm going to give the boot, but it won't happen by next week. Oh, so okay. That's fine. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, well, what should I say? Okay. Um, so the site itself is Mike talks.co, uh, freebie on my site. I think it's pretty great. It's tips for speaking. I mean, I guess I should think it's great, but it's tips for speaking that you wouldn't have learned in business school. So I, I feel like a lot of us, the, the speaking that we do comes from basically paying attention to what other people do or a public speaking class that you took when you're like 19 or at best when you're in business school. Yeah. And those things are like good starter things, but, but the freebie on my site goes a layer deeper. So like an example of that, I think most of us were taught at some point, if you're gonna talk about problems and solutions, you should list all of the problems, talk about all of them, then move over to, move over to all of the solutions. But what you should actually do is go back and forth between those two things. Yeah. So like, that's one of the things that I go through, uh, one of the things that I go through there. Okay. All right. We could, well, I suggest you check out everything that Mike has to offer because <laughs> it's so good. Thanks so much for being on. I knew you were going to be hilarious. Yes. And Gina, you're the best. I'm sorry <laughs> I tried to take over your podcast, but I just think you're great Anytime. and you do, you do such a good service for people. So thank you for having me on. Um, and uh, everybody out there, like this woman knows what she's talking about. So follow what she says. Oh, thanks, Mike. So do you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I love so many different points from this interview. From Mike's story about his sweet dad, to how we need to lower our goals for humor, to thinking about how you can drop your audience into the scene and make it come alive for them. How are you going to use some of Mike's principles to tell better stories for your course and content? I know I jotted down a few notes of my own to use for the future. Well, drop me a line in Insta at Course Creation Boutique to let me know how you're going to use some of the stuff that Mike covered. I'll be, of course, back next week where I'm going to kick off my course launch series. I'll do a series of episodes where I walk through questions to ask when you're launching, mistakes to look out for, including some that I have made, and then I've got an amazing interview planned about launch game changers. Please rate and review this episode, especially if you're listening on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Until next week, go create, be you and be brilliant and get it done.